Night in Kabul, the United States ended 20 years of war in Afghanistan, the longest war in American history. We completed one of the biggest airlifts in history with more than 120,000 people evacuated to safety. That number is more than double what most experts thought were possible. No nation, no nation has ever done anything like it in all of history. The only the United States had the capacity and the will and the ability to do it, and we did it today. The extraordinary success of this mission was due to the incredible skill, bravely, and selfless courage of the United States military and our diplomats and intelligence professionals. For weeks, they risked their lives to get American citizens, Afghans who helped us, citizens of our allies and partners and others on board planes and out of the country. And they did it, facing the crush of enormous crowds seeking to leave the country. And they did it, knowing ISIS-K terrorists, sworn enemies of the Taliban, were lurking in the midst of those crowds. And still, the women and men of the United States military, our diplomatic corps, and intelligence professionals did their job and did it well, risking their lives, not for professional gains, but to serve others. Not in a mission of war, but in a mission of mercy. Right. 20 service members were wounded in the service of this mission. 13 heroes gave their lives. I was just at Dover Air Force Base for the dignified transfer. We owe them and their families a debt of gratitude we can never repay, but we should never, ever, ever forget. In April, I made a decision to end this war. As part of, as part of that decision, we set the date of August 31st for American troops to withdraw. The assumption was that more than 300,000 Afghan national security forces that we had trained over the past two decades and equipped would be a strong adversary in their civil wars with the Taliban. That assumption that the Afghan government would be able to hold on for a period of time beyond military drawdown turned out not to be accurate. But I still instructed our national security team to prepare for every eventuality, even that one. And that's what we did. So we were ready when the Afghan security forces, after two decades of fighting for their country and losing thousands of their own, did not hold on as long as anyone expected. We were ready when they, the people of Afghanistan, watched their own government collapse and the president flee amid the corruption and malfeasance, handing over the country to their enemy, the Taliban, and significantly increasing the risk to U.S. personnel and our allies. As a result, to safely extract American citizens before August 31st, as well as embassy personnel, allies and partners, and those Afghans who had worked with us and fought alongside of us for 20 years, I had authorized 6,000 troops, American troops, to Kabul to help secure the airport. As General McKenzie said, this is the way the mission was designed. It was designed to operate under severe stress and attack, and that's what it did. Since March, we reached out 19 times to Americans in Afghanistan with multiple warnings and offers to help them leave Afghanistan, all the way back as far as March. After we started the evacuation 17 days ago, we did initial outreach and analysis and identified around 5,000 Americans who had decided earlier to stay in Afghanistan, but now wanted to leave. Our Operation Allied Rescue ended up getting more than 5,500 Americans out. We got out thousands of citizens and diplomats from those countries that went up to, into Afghanistan with us to get bin Laden. We got out locally employed staff of the United States Embassy and their families, totaling roughly 2,500 people. We got thousands of Afghan translators and interpreters 
and others who supported the United States out as well. Now we believe that about 100 or 200 Americans remain in Afghanistan with some intention to leave. Most of those who remain are dual citizens, long-time residents who had early decided to stay because of their family roots in Afghanistan. The bottom line, 90% of Americans in Afghanistan who wanted to leave were able to leave. And for those remaining Americans, there is no deadline. We remain committed to get them out if they want to come out. Secretary of State Blinken is leading the continued diplomatic efforts to ensure safe passage for any American, Afghan partner, or foreign national who wants to leave Afghanistan. In fact, just yesterday, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution that sent a clear message about the international community expects the Taliban to deliver on moving forward, notably freedom of travel, freedom to leave. And together, we are joined by over 100 countries that are determined to make sure the Taliban upholds those commitments. It will include ongoing efforts in Afghanistan to reopen the airport, as well as overland routes, allowing for continued departure to those who want to leave and deliver humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan. The Taliban has made public commitments, broadcast on television and radio across Afghanistan, on safe passage for anyone wanting to leave, including those who worked alongside Americans. We don't take them by their word alone, but by their actions. And we have leverage to make sure those commitments are met. Let me be clear. Leaving August the 31st is not due to an arbitrary deadline. It was designed to save American lives. My predecessor, the former president, signed an agreement with the Taliban to remove U.S. troops by May the 1st, just months after I was inaugurated. It included no requirement that the Taliban work <coughs> out a cooperative government arrangement with the Afghan government, but it did authorize the release of 5,000 prisoners last year, including some of the Taliban's top war commanders, among those who just took control of Afghanistan. By the time I came to office, the Taliban was in the strongest military position since 2001, controlling or contesting nearly half of the country. The previous administration's agreement said that if we stuck to the May 1st deadline that they had signed on to leave by, the Taliban wouldn't attack any American forces. But if we stayed, all bets were off. So we're left with a simple decision. Either follow through on the commitment made by the last administration and leave Afghanistan, or say we weren't leaving and commit another tens of thousands more troops going back to war. That was the choice, the real choice, between leaving or escalating. I was not going to extend this forever war. And I was not extending a forever exit. The decision to end the military lift operations at Kabul airport was based on the unanimous recommendation of my civilian and military advisors, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and all the service chiefs and the commanders in the field. Their recommendation was that the safest way to secure the passage of the remaining Americans and others out of the country was not to continue with 6,000 troops on the ground in harm's way in Kabul, but rather to get them out through non-military means. In the 17 days that we operated in Kabul, after the Taliban seized power, we engaged in an around-the-clock effort to provide every American the opportunity to leave. Our State Department was working 24-7, contacting and talking, and in some cases walking, 
Americans into the Air Force. Again, more than 5,500 Americans were airlifted out. And for those who remain, we will make arrangements to get them out if they so choose. As for the Afghans, we and our partners have airlifted 100,000 of them. No country in history has done more to airlift out the residents of another country than we have done. We will continue to work to help more people leave the country who are at risk. We're far from done. For now, I urge all Americans to join me in grateful prayer for our troops and diplomats and intelligence officers who carried out this mission of mercy in Kabul and a tremendous risk of such unparalleled results. An, air, an airlift that evacuated tens of thousands to a network of volunteers and veterans who helped identify those needing evacuation, guide them to the airport, and provided them for their support along the way. We're going to continue to need their help. We need your help, and I'm looking forward to meeting with you. And to everyone who is now offering or who will offer to welcome Afghan allies to their homes around the world, including in America. We thank you. I take responsibility for the decision. Now, some say we should have started mass evacuation sooner. And couldn't this have been done, have been done in a more orderly manner? I respectfully disagree. Imagine if we've begun evacuations in June or July, bringing in thousands of American troops and evacuating more than 120,000 people in the middle of a civil war. There still would have been a rush to the airport, a breakdown in confidence and control of the government, and it still would have been very difficult and dangerous mission. The bottom line is there is no evacuation, evacuation from the end of a war that you can run without the kinds of complexities, challenges, and threats we faced. None. There are those who would say we should have stayed indefinitely for years on end. They ask, why don't we just keep doing what we were doing? Why do we have to change anything? The fact is, everything had changed. My predecessor had made a deal with the Taliban. When I came into office, we faced a deadline, May 1. The Taliban onslaught was coming. We faced one of two choices, follow the agreement of the pre previous administration and extend it to have or extend to have more time for people to get out, or send in thousands of more troops and escalate the war. To those asking for a third decade of war in Afghanistan, I ask, what is the vital national interest? In my view, we only have one, to make sure Afghanistan can never be used again to launch an attack on our homeland. Remember why we went to Afghanistan in the first place? Because we were attacked by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda on September 11, 2001. And they See, they're mixing it up right here. They're still mixing it up. They're saying bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. They're still not revealing the truth to the American people that it was the Saudis that has been masterminding this from the get-go. It was the Saudis that was financing this from the get-go. Financing basically all terrorist groups over in that Middle East area. So they're still leaning towards the lie. When are they going to come out of, of telling the truth to the American people? You know, ever since I've always grown up in understanding, I guess you'd call it theology, in war, whenever a person went to war with another country, they went to war to obtain their 
their oil or their food or their finances, their their abilities, their their knowledge. There was there was supposed to have been gain, according to the way that I've understood it in the Bible, in going to war with another group of people. The way that we've done it, it's been a costly onslaught from the get-go towards not getting the bang for the buck, financially speaking, in addition to all the lives that has been sacrificed, not just these 13, but all the lives that has been lost, in addition to trying to go over there and reform a country to begin with. We didn't go over there to take their assets and to gain control of that country. We went over there to reform them people. And once we realized after 20 something years that we wasn't gonna be able to reform them, then all of a sudden we back out. After investing that much time, and that much energy and that much effort towards trying to reform them. Once more, we didn't go in there to take their homes and their houses. We didn't go in there to take their diamonds and, their, and all the other assets that they may have had. The bottom line is this, Bin Laden sought the Afghan people for a place of refuge. The Taliban to this day still denies that they had anything to do with 9-11 and I believe them. I think the primary suspects of 9-11 come from the very people that was so jointly connected together with the Bush family that obviously certain politicians to this day still does not want to totally reveal to the American people towards what's actually going on here. And because of it, they keep throwing one with the other towards hoping that the American people will buy it. Well, I'm not going to buy it, Mr. Biden. I've supported you in lots of different areas, but this is one area that I'm not going to buy in to this hypocrisy. That's exactly the reason why that we have lost over $6 trillion in the past 30-something years. And instead of bringing stability, that was supposed to have been the primary reason why the Bushes, they asked Bush and Cheney and, and Rumsfeld, I think Rumsfeld's dead now, but, but I think they asked them together, they said, well, what's the primary purpose for going over there? And the response was to rid the axes of evil that was point number one. And point number two was to bring stability to the region. Have we brought stability to that region? After us knowing who they are and who's taking over, if anything, we've added insult to misery because now they've got all these tanks, all these guns, all these planes, all this other stuff over there that they didn't have before. So in actuality, the way that I understand it, We've taken one step forward and two steps back pertaining to wanting to bring stability and rid the axis of evil because the axis of evil is still at large. Not only over in Pakistan or Afghanistan, excuse me, but also over in Saudi Arabia. I've always been told that if you're ever going to go bear hunting, do not intend on wounding the animal. And there's a reason for that. And that reason is, if you wound the animal, it gives the animal an opportunity or a chance to come back twice as aggressive, twice as strong, twice as, as uh, vicious as what it was the first time that could cause that much more devastation to the person that wounded the animal to begin with. You cannot play with evil. You cannot play with these people. There is only one course of action that if you're going to discharge any type of aggression towards these people is to get on the same level that they're on. I'm really, really surprised that they have managed to lay low for a year ever since the agreement took place. And I'm extremely, extremely surprised that there wasn't more bombing attacks, regardless whether it was coming from the Taliban or ISIN 
are out of the other 67 known terrorist groups, not counting the unknown terrorist groups over in that area, I'm really surprised that there wasn't more harm and hurt, and thank God it wasn't, to our American troops. Now, we can get up on national TV and we can scream and holler, whistling Dixie all we want. But the fact of the matter is the American taxpayers has bit the bullet on this. We have been over backwards on this, going all the way back to the Reagan and the, Bush, the Mr. Senior Bush era. And one administration is trying to cover up the lie from the other administration. And once you ever start doing that, it's just total hypocrisy to the American people. And I think the American people are wise to it, and I think the American people are sick of it. Because if the truth be known, our federal as well as our state governments failed to produce the safety for the American people pertaining to ever allowing for this situation to ever come out onto the American land to begin with towards created 9-11. In addition to all the other gun infestations that has unleashed into society with all the, uh, the uh, drugs and, and now all the uh, massive shootings that's going on, not just in your bigger cities, but now it's going on everywhere. So whenever it comes to the politicians that, yes, the taxpayers has been, been uh, fitting a bill on, and we're promised that you're going to bring safety and security into our lives, we have not gotten that in which what we was promised, which is safety and security. The politicians have failed the American people. This government has failed the American people. There's no way that you can you can reason it out, you can, you can kind of try to excuse it out. There's no way that you can try to bring practicality to what has happened in the past 30 plus years towards us being $30 trillion in whole. All our roads and our bridges is collapsing, are dilapidating. In addition to all the gun violence, in addition to all the drugs, in addition to, yes, the terrorism, uh, the domestic terrorism that recently we went through as far as January 6th and all the other problems that has come about since a wrong decision was made beginning at the latter part of Ronald Reagan's administration pertaining to the Republicans. Now, I don't know if this guy here has got the backbone of standing up and telling the American people he said he said that he was not going to be misleading. He told us that he was going to tell the truth. But what is the truth? I think it was a ruler in the book of Acts that questioned Paul after Paul told him about the truth. The, the ruler looked at him and said, what is the truth? Well, the truth is the reality towards what has occurred. And the truth is the reality towards what we're living in today. And the truth is based around the reality of what we're going to do tomorrow. That's called reality. That's called the truth. And whenever you deviate from these realities, you're no longer telling the truth. Now you're telling a what? There you go. A lie. There's high upper brass that knows not just part of the truth, but the whole truth pertaining to Mr. Powell, Cheney, the Bushes, the old people that was in the old administration when, when Ronald Reagan was president and, and Mr. Senior Bush, as well as uh, the Clinton administration, as well as the young Bush administration, whenever we actually got attacked, they know the truth, but they're still disguising it because they've got too much invested in the Saudi Arabia government. I don't know who it was that gave OPEC over to the Saudi Arabians to begin with, but somebody needs to go knock on his or her door and wanting to know how come that occurrence ever took place that basically started the ball rolling 
towards the rest of the nations now having to be trampled upon because of this ideology called terrorism. Yes, terrorism existed whenever I was growing up in the 60s and in the 70s pertaining to, pertaining to foreign affairs. But it was held down to a level that they dealt with it over there and we only know about it over here. It wasn't until the exchange of guns for hostages during the Nixon leading up into the Reagan era or, or maybe it was the Carter area, I, I don't forgot, you can look it up yourself, of whenever these problems that was being created over in the Middle East pertaining to terrorism was now, was now openly coming over here and affecting our lives. Well, for the past 30 something years, our lives have been devastated. We haven't just been affected by this. We have been devastated by this, not only emotionally, but physically and financially and spiritually and every other kind of way. So you can't tell me that the upper brass has not made a mistake in providing safety and security for the American people and leading us down a road down a road that was nothing more than an abacle, a, a heresy, a basically a road of despair. You don't wound the bear. If you go in to take the bear, you kill the bear. You would have been better off to have kept your gun and kept your powder dry and not even went after the bear if the only thing that you was going to do was, was upset the bear, wound the bear. And now we're walking away from Afghanistan with billions of dollars worth of equipment. Billions of dollars worth of stuff that now they can modify and now upgrade and actually becoming more advanced towards sure enough becoming somebody's true blue once again nightmare. So have we brought stability to the region? No. Did we take out the axes of evil? No. Have we done what we was appointed to do going back even, even, let's say, going back 20 years ago, we could have taken a special known black ops group and taken out bin Laden, just like we took out Saddam Hussein. We didn't have to go in and devote 20 years and, and trillions and trillions of dollars, not counting all the lives that's gotten taken because of this. We didn't have to, do, but we didn't have to do this, but we did it. Now, let's ask the simple question, why did we do it? Okay, that goes back to what young Bush said in Cheney. We, we done it to rid the axes of evil. And we did it to bring stability to a region. Well, I don't see that neither one has been fulfilled. And the only thing that I can see is more grief and despair coming down the road because now you have wounded the bear. You have created a hive that now the bees can not only live in, but they can grow in, multiply in, and become twice as lethal as what they was before they ever started their rage, their swarm. Let's listen to the rest of Mr. Biden, and I, and I say what I say out of respect towards him being the chief of commander, but at the same time, I say what I say for the benefit of the American people and not the benefit of Mr. Biden. Because there's more people that I hear on national TV that is against towards what has happened here than it is people that's for it. Now, he can go up there and he can explain this away. He can explain that away. He can theorize with this and theorize with that. But the bottom line is the American people has caught on to this towards the big guy pulling the little guy's uh, uh, string and it's always the little guy 
that winds up having to pull the brunt of the load, regardless whether it's labor, finances, or things being taken from us, and we're tired of our roads dilapidating and us not concentrating on our problems over here while we're trying to take care of other people's problems over there. What's more, if you go to war with a, with a group of people, I was always taught that you go in and you gather up whatever that it is that you went to war for to begin with. So in actuality, we actually did come become a reform nation builder. Why? Why did we become a reform nation builder of the people over in Afghanistan? Especially if they wasn't willing to fight for it themselves and lay down and surrender to the Taliban like a bunch of cowards. In the meantime, we've got thousands and thousands of people, not just the 13. I feel sorry for the, for the loved ones and the friends and neighbors pertaining to the 13, but what about all the other thousands? that has went through similar circumstances towards having to having to wake up with that same person not being at that table, with that same person not relying upon bringing groceries and putting them in the icebox, towards that same person not being able to enjoy their company, because now that person's gone. You can't bring them back. They're gone. This has turned in to nothing but a nightmare that began 30 something years ago at the White House and now various people up there are still trying to cover up for their mistakes and of course the people in generally speaking they have a right that whenever they hear my side of the story they can either accept it or reject it they can either support it or they can or they can kick it out like I'm a lunatic or like that I don't know what I'm talking about. But I guarantee you, eventually, the ugly snake will stick out its ugly head again. And when it does, we will see who truly masterminded and brought all this grief, not just to the American people's lives, but to the world. Now let's listen to the rest of our chief and commander. We're based in Afghanistan. We delivered justice to bin Laden on May 2nd, 2011, over a decade ago. Al-Qaeda was decimated. I respectfully suggest you ask yourself this question. If we've been attacked on September 11, 2001, from Yemen instead of Afghanistan, would we have ever gone to war in Afghanistan? Even though the Taliban controlled Afghanistan in the year 2001, I believe the honest answer is no. That's because we had no vital interest in Afghanistan other than to prevent an attack on America's homeland and their friend, our friends. And that's true today. We succeed. If that's true today, how come we can't even prevent our own people from attacking us? We can't even prevent domestic terrorism from happening right here in our own land pertaining to our own people. And what makes us think that we're going to be able to stop others that live across the sea whenever we have all these open gate borders, all these exchange students, where you got all these different nationalities over here, there's no way that we can create a safe, harbor for the American people whenever you got people stacked on top of people towards the enemy being right here not just at our gate but in our gate the wolf is in the chicken coop and I tend to wonder if some of our politicians hasn't buddied up with the wolf because of greed, because of selfishness because of the good old monetary, good old dollar bill that's what I tend to believe. And you know what? If the truth be known, there's a great deal of Americans out there that believe the same thing. Now, I don't know if they're going to have the guts or the will to stand up to what they believe or what they think, such as I, I do. I've heard various testimonies coming from various 
military officers. One recently just got through surrendering a 17 year long life investment in the military that he basically walked away from not only his stance in the military, but he walked away from his retirement, walked away from his insurance. Why did he do that? He done that because he had a strong passion that something incredibly was going wrong with the, with the establishment that he had supported and been behind and willing to lay down his life for for the past 17 years. That's the reason why he done what he done. And there's many more out there from the from the things that I'm hearing that's willing to basically do the same. Now, whether or not they do it or not, I don't know. But it, it, it has gotten to the point that it is out of hand and the people know it. And the people, the American people, deserve better than this. Do you think that what we set out to do in Afghanistan over a decade ago then we stayed for another decade. It was time to end this war. This is a new world. The terror threat has metastasized across the world, well beyond Afghanistan. We face threats from El Shabaab in Somalia, Al Qaeda affiliates in Syria and the Arabian Peninsula, and ISIS attempting to create a caliphate in Syria and Iraq and establishing affiliates across Africa and Asia. The fundamental obligation of a president, in my opinion, is to defend and protect America. That's right. Not against threats of 2001, but against the threats of 2021 and tomorrow. That is the guiding principle behind my decisions about Afghanistan. I simply do not believe that the safety and security of America is enhanced by continuing to deploy thousands of American troops and spending billions of dollars a year in Afghanistan. But I also know that the threat from terrorism continues in its pernicious and evil nature. But it's changed, expanded to other countries. Our strategy has to change too. We will maintain the fight against terrorism in Afghanistan and other countries. We just don't need to fight a ground war to do it. We have what's called over the horizon capabilities, which means we can strike terrorists and targets without American boots on the ground, or very few if needed. We've shown that capacity just in the last week. We struck ISIS-K remotely days after they murdered 13 of our service members and dozens of innocent Afghans. And to ISIS-K, we are not done with you yet. As commander in chief, I firmly believe the best path to guard our safety and our security lies in a tough, unforgiving, targeted, precise strategy that goes after terror where it is today, not where it was two decades ago. That's what's in our national interest. And here's a critical thing to understand. The world is changing. We're engaged in a serious competition with China. We're dealing with the challenges on multiple fronts with Russia. We're confronted with cyber attacks and nuclear proliferation. We have to shore up America's competitive to meet these new challenges in the competition for the 21st century. We can do both. Fight terrorism and take on new threats that are here now and will continue to be here in the future. And there's nothing China or Russia would rather have, would want more, in this competition in the United States to be bogged down another decade in Afghanistan. As we turn the page on the foreign policy that has guided our our nation the last two decades, we've got to learn from our mistakes. To me, there are two that are paramount. First, we must set missions with clear, achievable goals 
not ones we'll never reach. And second, we must stay clearly focused on the fundamental national security interest of the United States of America. This decision about Afghanistan is not just about Afghanistan. It's about ending an era of major military operations to remake other countries. We saw a mission of counterterrorism in Afghanistan, getting the terrorists and stopping attacks, morph into a counterinsurgency, nation building trying to create a democratic, cohesive, and united Afghanistan, something that has never been done over many centuries of Afghan history. Moving on from that mindset and those kind of large-scale troop deployments will make us stronger and more effective and safer at home. And for anyone who gets the wrong idea, let me say it clearly. To those who wish America harm, to those who engage in terrorism against us or our allies, know this, the United States will never rest. We will not forgive, we will not forget. We'll hunt you down to the ends of the earth and we will, you will pay the ultimate price. And let me be clear, we'll continue to support the Afghan people through diplomacy, international influence and humanitarian aid. We'll continue to push for regional diplomacy engagement to prevent violence and instability. We'll continue to speak out for the basic rights of the Afghan people, especially women and girls, as we speak out for women and girls all around the globe. And I've been clear that human rights will be the center of our foreign policy. But the way to do that is not through endless military deployments but through diplomacy, economic tools, and rallying the rest of the world for support. My fellow Americans, the war in Afghanistan is now over. I'm the fourth president who has faced the issue of whether and when to end this war. When I was running for president, I made a commitment to the American people that I would end this war. Today, I've honored that commitment. It was time to be honest with the American people again. We no longer had a clear purpose in an open-ended mission in Afghanistan. After 20 years of war in Afghanistan, I refused to send another generation of America's sons and daughters to fight a war that should have ended long ago. After more than $2 trillion spent in Afghanistan, cost that researchers at Brown University estimated would be over $300 million a day for 20 years in Afghanistan, for two decades. Yes, the American people should hear this, $300 million a day for two decades. You can take the number of $1 trillion, as many say, that's still $150 million a day for two decades. What have we lost as a consequence in terms of opportunities? I refuse to continue a war that was no longer in the service of the vital national interest of our people. And most of all, after 800,000 Americans serving Afghanistan, I traveled that whole country, brave and honorable service. After 20,744 American servicemen and women injured and the loss of 2,461 American personnel, including 13 lives, lost just this week. I refuse to open another decade of warfare in Afghanistan. We've been a nation too long at war. If you're 20 years old today, you've never known an America at peace. So when I hear that we could have, should have, continued the so-called low-grade effort in Afghanistan at low risk to our service members, at low cost. I don't think enough people understand how much we have asked of the 1% of this country who put that uniform on, willing to put their lives on the line in defense of our nation. Maybe it's because my deceased son, Bo, served in Iraq for a full year before that. 
Maybe it's because of what I've seen over the years as Senator, Vice President, and President traveling these countries. A lot of our veterans and their families have gone through hell. Deployment after deployment. Months and years away from their families. Missed birthdays. Anniversaries. Empty chairs at holidays. Financial struggles. Divorces. Loss of limbs. Traumatic brain injury. Post-traumatic stress. We see it in the struggles many have when they come home. We see it in the strain on their families and caregivers. We see it in the strain of their families when they're not there. We see it in the grief borne by their survivors. The cost of war, they will carry with them their whole lives. Most tragically, we see in the shocking and stunning statistic that should give pause to anyone who thinks war can never be low grade, low risk, or low cost. 18 veterans, on average, who die by suicide every single day in America. Not in a far place, right here in America. There's nothing low grade or low risk or low cost about any war. It's time to end the war in Afghanistan. As we close 20 years of war and strife and pain and sacrifice, it's time to look at the future, not the past. To a future that's safer. To a future that's more secure. To a future that honors those who served and all those who gave what President Lincoln called their last full measure of devotion. I give my word with all of my heart. I believe this is the right decision, a wise decision, and the best decision for America. Thank you. Thank you, and may God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. All right, we've been listening there to President Biden give his fiercest defense yet, I would say, about his decision, his decision to get out on this day from the America's longest war, and I think to silence the doubters and the critics. Yeah, far more forceful uh, remarks than the president's made the three previous times about um, about uh, Afghanistan. Um, of course, we'll continue our, our breaking news coverage of the president's address on the end of the longest war in U.S. history. Uh, we turn now to the league that hasn't accomplished a thing pertaining to bringing safety and security to that region. And the people that masterminded 9-11 are still at large because they was the ones that financed it and they was the ones that, that brought a grief-stricken nation that was thriving at one time during the 60s, 70s, and the 80s and even through a big part of the 90s through Bill Clinton's administration that has now brought all of us down to another level, not only another level of uncertainty, but another level of poverty. People want to know the truth. Yeah, he probably done an excellent job towards what he done and how that he done it. There ain't no probably to it, he did. Our troops done extensively well pretending to getting all that many people out of there. But the American people want to know this. What's in it for us pertaining to going over there and sacrificing not only money, labor, time, but lives? What did we get out of it? Especially once we realized that the very same people that we was at war with for 20-something years, now we've walked away and given them all the toys and all the assets that at one time we was in charge of, now we've given it back over to them. And we're supposed to trust these people? We're supposed to trust these people? Did those hundred, over 100,000 people that was Afghanistan's to begin with, did they trust them? Hell no, they didn't trust them. That's the reason why they was getting on an airplane towards getting out of there was because they know 
what type of rootless barbarians that these people are. And now, since they've gotten more, more toys to play with, they're even going to become more lethal work. It's time that the American people quit biting the lies of various politicians hook, line, and sinker and started smelling some of the stuff that the American people has been walking in and been involved in towards the sacrifices that's been made that we continue to scratch our head towards why? Why have we made these sacrifices? You know, whenever our men and women sacrificed after Pearl Harbor got attacked, we got a bang for the buck later on after World War II was over with towards getting our economy back up and going and that's whenever America becomes strong towards being the number one nation in the world. We have lost that. We have lost that position. We have lost that dignity and the American people deserve better than that and they want to know, most of us do, where did it go? And how come it basically left as quickly and as easily as it did after our ancestors sacrificed what they sacrificed towards us holding the line and towards us maintaining that same position in the world. Where did, I, where did, where did we go wrong towards losing that stance? It's very obvious that Mr. Joe Biden didn't want to take no no questions because I'm pretty sure that there was people that was going to question him that there was no way for him to be able to address in a sensible answer pertaining to this because it doesn't make sense from a military perspective on none of it of what has occurred here other than the fact of us being a building nation in allowing for others to gain off of our misery. So that's supposed to be the interest of the American people. The war in Afghanistan should have ended shortly after they'd taken bin Laden out. That was whenever there was groups of people that should have said, you know what, we got the main perpetrator. Let's go ahead and end this thing, boys, and let's, let's wrap it up. That's whenever America, our military, become a building nation. We thought that we was going to be able to go over there and conform these people. In these people's eyes, if they can't conform you, they'll kill you. And if they get killed in trying to kill you, they automatically go to heaven and live with Allah 99 virgins and drink all the wine that they want because these are the people that's corrupted their minds are are twisted they have been bamboozled they are walking in the unices of satan not the unices of the god of abraham the god of isaac and the god of jacob and they for darn sure ain't walking in the unices of the god of jesus christ of nazareth towards their actions towards how that they don't allow for women to have any type of freedom these are some of the most ruthless dictators on the planet, beginning with the Saudis. The people deserve to know the truth about what the hell is going on. And we're still being lied to today. Good luck to all of us. I felt like going ahead and documenting this. I felt like that it needed to be documented. You know, I realize that the truth be known, Biden got played by Donald Trump in an entrapment deal to the point that Biden had to do something one way or the other like he was talking about, either engage towards more troops in fighting the Taliban or backing out. Well, this should have been pre-planned is what the American people were saying, and it should have been pre-planned in stages towards immediately given a year to do so towards pulling out our tanks, pulling out our machine guns, pulling out all our other equipment, 
it should have been done in stages and not in the last 17 or 18 days towards, hey, everybody, let's get out. It wasn't planned out correctly. And now we've let billions of dollars worth of equipment over there that, yes, can be altered and can be modified to their benefit, not ours. And this is war strategies coming from the Pentagon? This is war strategies coming from the White House? These are the people that's supposed to be providing safety and security and can't even provide safety and security on our own streets, in our own neighborhoods, in our own country? And now all of a sudden you're going to protect us from them? Whenever you can't even protect us from you? It's sad. It's horribly sad. And the nightmare continues to intensify and grow on. I'm going to say this and I'm going to leave it alone. Whenever I was in the auto body industry towards working on cars or trucks, if you ever began a project towards cheating, and you was going to cheat a little bit here. Let's say you was putting on a quarter panel and you didn't get it exactly backed up on the back panel like it sh should have been. The next thing you know, you got to cheat because you've already got it welded in by pushing up the front door. I mean the back door. You got to just lodge the bolts and push the front, the back door forward, give or take about three millimeters. Well, once you do that, then you got to go to the front door, especially if it's a four door car and you got to push the front door forward probably four or five millimeters. Well, by the time you get through pushing the fender forward four or five, maybe six millimeters to keep it from rubbing the door, now you got everything cockeyed on the front of the grill of the way the headlights fit, the way the bumper fits, the way the hood sets down in, in, the, uh, in the square hole that's supposed to be completely square for the hood. You, you offset everything. The point that I'm trying to make is this, whenever you tell one little lie and then you tell another lie to cover up that lie, then you got to continue to tell lie after lie after lie after lie to hope that you'll cover it up at the end of the project or the end of the job that no one has noticed that things has gotten cockeyed. I'm going to use that analogy. Cockeyed. That's what's happened here. Things has gotten cockeyed. And the reason why they've gotten cockeyed is because they wasn't handled properly pertaining to the Reagans and the Bushes that covered up working through the church sector pertaining to biblical Bible prophecy and did not, not only did they did not support the ministry the way that they should have had but they attacked the ministry and allowed for other agencies and governments regardless whether it was the government of Oklahoma the government of Kentucky state uh, government or the government of the state of Tennessee they allowed for various entities to attack the founder hoping that eventually they would do the founder in or or the founder himself would do himself in by either going over that red line are becoming so aggravated that he wound up basically committing suicide or doing something just as crazy as suicide, which basically would be the same thing as shooting himself in the foot. But instead, the founder's still alive. And the founder's talking now. And the founder is revealing the truth pertaining to the founder actually being one of the witnesses. Because I have witnessed what's went on in my lifetime, being 60 years old, going all the way back to whenever I was 23, whenever an automobile rolled over on top of me, I think I was 23, it may have been 24, whenever an automobile rolled over on top of me in 1983, beginning the phases of the biblical Bible prophecy that nobody not only wanted to support, but they wanted to end. They wanted to attack it. They wanted to uh, dislodge it. They wanted to, to uh, uh, do away with, with the founder 
to where the ministry, the windmill ministries, basically just died and just faded away. That's what they was hoping. But because the founder was so deeply rooted in Christ, not in his ideology, but in God himself, it was God that protected the founder, and now the founder is revealing the truth. And he's exposing the truth to not only the American people, but to the world. Now you got a choice with the 9-11 coming up within the next week or so. You've got a choice that you can continue to buy this sack of goods that has been fed, stuffed, and forced down the American people's throats in the past 30-something years since 9-11. Well, I'm, I, I, let me back up. Let me, let me back up. For the past 20 years since 9-11, but the past 30 years since Desert Storm and Desert Shield, you can either continue to buy this sack of goods that the White House obviously is covering over one lie versus another one. And as far as I'm concerned, they're just as guilty as the people that originated the lie towards starting the cheating game. Kind of like cheating on that quarter panel or cheating on that door. They're just as guilty because they're not revealing the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to the American people. And because of it, our roads has fallen apart. Our jobs has left us. People's committing suicide. COVID is attacking us. Now we're being attacked by either droughts or being attacked by plague, by the tornado floods, or now hurricanes again and again and again. There has to be some sort of reasoning pertaining to all this bad luck. And it's only going to be the minds of the wise that's going to be able to sit down and figure out, well, maybe this individual that's telling us all this, maybe there is something to what he's saying. Because there's no doubt we have taken a dive for the worse. We have gone from being a top-notch society that was dominating the rest of the global society to the point that now if we keep on, we're going to wind up being a third country third world country and we've almost become that compared to China and compared to two or three other countries that are thriving huffing and puffing and, and growing in leaps and bounds like I said they can't even protect us from hackers they can't even protect us from the onslaught of some maniac kid grabbing up a gun or an adult and going out here on a shooting spree towards killing up a massacre of a bunch of innocent people. They can't even protect us from our own potholes that continue to go bad towards depreciating the value of our automobiles every time we drive over it, towards making it squeak and rattle and wear out in places that it shouldn't be wearing out. We're giving $70,000 for some of these automobiles now. That's more money than whenever I was growing up that you would give for a home. It's out of kilter. It's out of balance. And until they're willing to come clean, and which I haven't yet seen it now for the past 30-something years, beginning with the, the old people that was associated with the Reagan administration, and this includes the media. This includes the, the uh, permissioner, uh, the, the church sector. All the above. It's only, we are only going to see things grow worse and worse and worse pertaining to the fires, misery of the COVID, earthquakes. That's the next thing that's possibly gonna, going to, to bend and bow the people over in the Bible Belt area. You know, I've tried and tried and tried to do things in, I feel like, in not only a justifiable way, but in a decent, civilized way. But nobody appreciates this. Or, let me say this, nobody has showed their appreciation. Nobody in this area has showed their appreciation by coming up to me and saying, Juby, we support you. We're, we back you. We're in behind you. You make a lot of sense. We understand that they're covering up for a mistake that they've made. Nobody has done that. 
And because nobody has done that, that makes me inclined to believe, well, they're all in this together. They have created this monster, and now they're waiting to either die out, or hoping that I, I'll die out, and hoping that it will all fade away, that it will be like an imaginary la-la land towards being out of sight and out of mind. I got news for you. It's not going away. The intensity of the, of the hurricanes is not going away. The potholes is not going away. Our drug abuse communities is not going away. Our daughters and our granddaughters and our, and our, and our children being displacing with all these problems and, and being seduced by, by all these low-life, no-good-for-nothing people that's on these drugs and becoming impregnated and, and, and having to go and abort children because you're afraid it's going to be retarded or something messed up. These problems are not going away. They are intensifying. And people like Biden and other big people can sit up there and snigger, laugh. Oh, yeah, they're comforted in their little comfort zone because they've got big, deep pockets. If you read the book of Revelations properly, in the first three chapters of Revelations, it says very thoroughly how God is going to unveil the idiocy, the stupidity, of these people that thinks that they're above and beyond any type of retribution pertaining to their wealth and their position that they hold in life. That is what is the next thing that's fixing to unfold that's going to cause a calamity in the planet that will probably be a hundred times worse than any hurricane or any earthquake. And I think that's where they're wanting to go with it. They're actually driving it off into the, to the, to the wall, kind of like a NASCAR driver. And that's the reason why nobody's really concerned about our, about our debt. And they're not really concerned. I mean, they say that they're concerned about the potholes in our infrastructure. But, I mean, whenever you go up there and you see them haggling, not for days, not for weeks, but sometimes months over a bill up there in the White House, you get, you got to get the full perspective of the fact that these people are deliberately playing this out. Now you have to figure out why are they playing it out? How come they're not going up there and doing their jobs according to what that we have hired them to do? It's obvious they've got something to hide. And they're playing on time. They're hoping that time is on their side. Well, people like me are still living. We still got our minds. We still got our thoughts. We still got our mouths. And we're still revealing the truth. Now, rather not the people want to believe the truth, that's up to them. You can lead a horse to the water trough, but you can't make them drink, is what my grandpappy used to always say. And if they don't want to listen, you can't make them listen. It's kind of like Noah. Noah put it out there to the general public. Noah was a messenger sent by God. Noah had a message. Many of them mocked Noah. They laughed at Noah. They accused Noah of being crazy. A lot of them accused Noah of being a liar. Accused Noah of being bogus. Accused Noah of being a blasphemer. That Noah never had a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Kind of like they done Jesus Christ. They accused him falsely towards being a blasphemer too. We can see in all the events, regardless whether it was Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, or Jesus Christ, in every situation, God has proven himself in the anointing during the season that it needed to be revealed. And the same thing will happen with the windmill ministries. Good luck to all of us as we continue to watch this thing unfold, unravel, watch this train wreck basically unfold right in front of our very eyes to the point that these highfalutin top brass people 
thinks that they're above and beyond any type of recourse pertaining to the American people that put them in power, that gave them their jobs to begin with. Good luck to all of us. As we say again and again and again from the Windmill Ministries, God bless America, God bless our troops, and shalom. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. As I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Precious Jesus, hold my hand. As I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Precious Jesus, hold my hand. Amen.